So welcome everyone to the webinar on obtaining happiness and resilience through holistic health. I'm Anthony Harcher. I'm a clinical nutritionist and lifestyle medicine specialist. A little bit about me uh, before I get into the exciting topic. So I'm a family man. Uh, my family's here on the left, uh, my wife, Adriana, and my two children, uh, Sophia and Ollie. Uh, they're my why, my passion, uh, they're everything to me. And essentially, I also have a, a strong passion for health and wellness, and that's what I share to the world. So uh, my passion is health wellness. My purpose is to help others. So I've married my passion and my purpose, and I'm living that today. So this is uh, a very satisfying moment uh, to get in front of you know people and to be able to share what I love. Uh, so my background, I didn't start out as a clinical nutritionist or lifestyle medicine specialist, although I have been parting my wisdom as I've been going along my journey ever since being a kid because I've had an interest in this area. Uh, I then decided to formalize that uh, after I spent 15 years in the corporate world as a chemical engineer. And I did a degree with, uh, uh, I won't say her name, but she's on the uh, webinar, so you can smile. Um, and uh, yes, I did. I studied uh, clinical nutrition with her. And I also did a Bachelor of Complementary Medicine. And I am um, living my dream. So very happy. Uh, so let's start with happiness. And I, I always keen to always talk about what defines happiness because often people get their own interpretation of what happiness is. And, I, and it's important we clarify that this at the start of the webinar. Uh, so the, the actual definition, and, and there's, there's varying degrees of this definition depending on where you look. Uh, so this term, happiness, is a state of being happy. So I really want to hone in on this word state. So a state is a particular condition with someone or something at a specific time. Okay, so it's a specific time. So this notion of I, want, I just want to be happy and stay happy, that is not happiness, right? Happiness is a state uh, at a specific time, just like with any other emotion, whether it be anger, grieving, sadness, joy, whatever it is, um, it is something that we experience for a particular time. We don't want sadness to continue forever, do we? Uh, just like we don't want to be angry forever. Some people may get stuck in these states. And certainly what I'm going to share with you today is how you can be in a more resourceful state to better regulate these emotions or have better controls uh, in terms of what you can do about it. There's obviously external influences uh, that you know influence our happiness in terms of positively or negatively. We often in the Western world externalize happiness and so we're just constantly looking for these external triggers of happiness but that's out of our control. And so what this webinar today is essentially helping you in, in terms of what you can control and be less reliant on these external triggers. I want you to see these external triggers of happiness as the icing on the cake. It may sound weird. I'm a nutritionist referring to a cake, but the, the cake itself is what we're going to be talking about today. Um, and that's what you can do in terms of supporting yourself so that you can better, uh, I guess, obtain or, or um, make happiness a habit of yours. So in terms of, you know, happy as itself is a feeling, right? So it's something we feel. So it's very subjective to the individual. Uh, so it's individ individualistic. So something that makes me happy or, or the feeling of happiness for me could be totally different for what you feel in terms of happiness, whether it be external or internal. So we need to be mindful that it is individualistic. Uh, so, you know, seeing some people get happy over winning a gold medal, that might not also correspond to happiness within you. So we, we need to see it from that individualistic point of view. 
So in terms of what brings me happiness, it's very much a something that I'm working on on a constant basis. And I often get a lot of happiness from my children, but I'm not reliant on that happiness coming from my children. I'm more focused on intrinsic signs of happiness. And that's me focusing on what I can control. And that's the holistic health element, which we're going to touch on shortly. I'm going to share some of my tips today in terms of what I do that really helps with me you know, obtaining this state of happiness, that being on occasion. <laughs> um, so it's not always, not all, it's not a permanent fix and it's not something that we should believe is a permanent fix. The only way you can achieve it permanently is uh, being on a, a drug, um, and that's not uh, that 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 is not resourceful long term. So um, it's certainly a state for a period of time. In terms of resilience, so what is resilience? You hear it a lot, and certainly, given you know we've just been through a global pandemic, uh, we've been through a lot of adversity and a lot of change. And so this term resilience has popped up a lot in conversations. And essentially, it's our ability to bounce back after a setback. So you want a, a good analogy is like a spring. So a spring, you know, contracting and then going back to its original shape or condition or form. And that's what we're going to be talking about in terms of what you can do to help with your resilience. Uh, and so it's, again, it's focusing on the, the cake, the internalization and the external uh, triggers or whatever, uh, the support that comes externally that helps with resilience. We're not reliant on that. We've, you know, we're focusing on doing what we can around building our resilience and then anything else is a bonus that happens outside of that, whether it be government assistance, people assistance, community assistance. We are focusing on what we can control and that is holistic health. So what is holistic health? Again, another definition and we're going to finish on the definitions here, but I just wanted to set the foundation about what I'm talking about today. So holistic health is a preventative, okay? So we're talking about a preventative mindset around health that takes into consideration the whole individual, okay? And it's one's own responsibility. I've underlined that, one's own responsibility. So it's not the government's responsibility. Yes, the government is there as a, as a backup, uh, but we need to take responsibility for our health. And I think the pandemic has certainly driven a lot more of that. People realizing that they can be less like medicine when the pandemic hit didn't have an answer. There was no vaccine when the pandemic hit. Uh, obviously, we've come up with a vaccine since then, but that's 13 months after. So in that period of time, the, the best thing we could do was look after ourselves. And that ultimately is what where we want to be focused is on looking after ourselves and not being reliant on external sources. Uh, and so in terms of this whole individual, we're talking about the social, the psychological, the environment that all impact one's health. And what we can do about that is what we take in in terms of nutrition, what we do around our movement and what we do around supporting our mental health and well-being. So that's essentially the diagram on the right is what we're going to be talking about. And I'm going to be talking about this in a practical sense. So it's going to be less of the definitions, uh, less of the theory, although there's obviously strong evidence base behind what I'll be talking about. It's going to be how you can practically apply it in your life. But before that, there's one last thing is my claimer. There's no disclaimer. I'm only going to claim uh, what, what could happen if you continue to watch this webinar. And I wanted to acknowledge that everything I share is general in nature uh, and that you are all very unique and special. So what I talk about in a generalized uh, sense may work for you or it may not. So I just want to be clear with that. I'm talking general terms. Uh, you are very unique and special, which is beautiful. 
Uh, this presentation may make you happy, uh, but it may also make you sad because it may bring up things that you're either not doing and feel bad about that you're not doing or it whatever. It may bring up some certain triggers. So I don't want that to be the intention. However, what I do know is in terms of the um, relationship between happy, happiness and sadness is that they're in, intertwined, okay, intertwined. Uh, so within happiness, there's an element of sadness. Within sadness is an element of happiness. And you see this all the time. You can see, you know, when people are deeply, you know, crying and crying and crying, and then all of a sudden there'll be a burst of laughter. And it's the same as when you're laughing lots and lots, then all of a sudden there'll be a tear. And it's because they're inter intertwined uh, with one another. So it's, um, it's, it, it is what it is. And uh, that's the beautiful thing about this state. It's a constant dynamic state. So happiness is a dynamic state. So is everything other, every other feeling. And we want it to be a dynamic state because it's the difference between the states is what really makes it so uh, – it's like the seasons. The change between the seasons is what makes them so special. If you constantly had summer, it wouldn't be special anymore. It, you'd get bored of it and sick of it. And so it's the same as happiness and sadness. Uh, so um, that's, uh, that's an important point. Uh, so, and the information I mentioned is evidence-based. I, I can share the resources and I will share some of the resources at the end of the presentation. And lastly is that point that I'm not perfect. And yes, I struggle with terminology. Uh, you'll hear it, you'll see it, but bear with me. Um, it is who I am and I'm obviously on a journey to um, perfecting my art, and I know perfectionism is a point of non accomplishment You'll never get to perfectionism, uh, but it's something that I always strive for. So I always strive to improve, but I always acknowledge that I'm not perfect. And so you're not going to get a perfect presentation. Uh, there will be slips and bumps, but that's what makes it enjoyable. You can have a laugh with me. Um, so in terms of uh, the happy, resilient day is very much centered on what you can control. And I've mentioned that a number of times. It's about focusing on what you can do on how, you know, and, and that response that you can choose to respond. Uh, obviously, there's things that can affect our ability to respond in a resourceful and in the manner we want to. And that's what we're going to cover today is the things that the foundations that you can lay so that you do respond to situations more resourcefully. Uh, so it is focused on what you can do and not on others or the government or any uh, anything else. It's purely on you. Uh, the other point around that, and it's an important point I raise now, is around our self-identity, right? Our self-image is how we perceive ourself, right? It's a perception of ourself. Others may perceive us differently. So you may see yourself as a grumpy person, Um Others may disagree, uh, but it's your perception of grumpy person. And this self-perception is with anything with life, we're looking to back up and support the way we're feeling or the way we see the world. And we look for evidence to support us, right? Because we, we all want to be justified. We want to be right. And so if you see yourself as a grumpy person, you will get evidence surrounding you, within you that you're a grumpy person. So I think it's important that if you want more happiness, you need to identify yourself as a happy person and think as a happy person would think, right? So a happy person is going to think more optimistically, even in adversity. So even throughout the pandemic, they would have been looking for the optimism. And just like we can find more grumpiness when we search for it and more hardship that's coming our way if we search for it, what you seek is what you find. And so if you seek happiness, if you seek optimism, you will find more of it in the world. Throughout the pandemic, you could have been reading all the adverse news, the terrible news, uh, and everything is bad about the pandemic. But there was so much greatness that came out of the pandemic. But you could have been blindsided, blindsided, totally blindsided to it because you weren't, you didn't have that lens that you were looking at the world 
as an optimistic person or as a happy person, um, you were looking at that world as everything is against me. And there is that law of attraction. Uh, what we put out is what we get back. Uh, so it's, it's true. Uh, and you'll see it with, you know, if you leave this webinar today thinking more like a happy person and start to look for it, you will find more of it. You'll find more reinforcing of that happy message. Um, it's the same as resilient. You, you know, if, if you want more resilience, you need to identify yourself as a resilient person. And I certainly, I do. And, you know, I suffered setbacks during, uh, like we all did, uh, through the um, COVID-19. But I, because I was looking for optimism and, and like, for, for example, I, I, I'll share a personal story. I would not be doing this webinar today if it wasn't for COVID-19. And so I wouldn't be a podcaster today if it wasn't for COVID-19. And so COVID-19 really made me step out of my comfort zone. I was uncomfortable about being on a podcast show. I was uncomfortable about doing a webinar and share because I, I often had that self-doubt. Who wants to listen to me? You know, am I someone that is, you know, shares a message that people resonate with? I had that self-doubt. You know, I, I'm a human. And so I'm thankful for COVID-19, for it making me step out of my comfort zone and now doing something that I love and I, you know, I'm grateful for. Um, and it's the same as the podcasting. I didn't, like I always had in the back of my mind, I, I would love to be a podcaster and, you know, get on there and, you know, have this microphone and, and, and share stories and, and empower others and help them on their health journey. But I just didn't have the self-belief, the self-confidence. And COVID helped me with that. It pushed me that edge because nothing, I had nothing. I had nothing to do during COVID. I had no business. I had no work. Uh, and so the only thing I could do was give my knowledge. And that's what I did throughout COVID. Uh, and I'm still doing that because I like to do it. Uh, it brings me joy and happiness. And so I just wanted to share that personal story as to so that you can better relate to the message I'm sharing. Really, it's important that you focus on what you can control and that you look at how you identify yourself. I now identify myself as not a want-to-be podcaster. I am a podcaster that owns a podcast show. I'm no longer a want-to-be webinar uh, provider. I am someone that's doing regular webinars and I love doing it. So, this is so important that if you want to be more resilient, more happy, you need to identify that. You, you need to identify with that. Now, what we know is that habits can help shape our identity. And that's what I'll be focusing on today. I cannot convince you by my mouth, by my stories, that you need to walk out of this webinar today and just automatically be happy. Um, but what I want to share with you is some habits that you can implement to help you be more happier. Uh, so uh, that's key. And that's probably, that's why I've got, got it as principle number one, because if you don't have that self-identity, then you're going to be, I guess, going against the wind. Uh, you're not going to have the tailwind with you. Uh, in terms of the second point around uh, these principles, it's very much that element of self-love and self-care. We need to love ourselves. Uh, if, if we can, you know, love ourselves, it is so much easier to give and want to give and get the joy from giving. If we don't have that love for ourselves, it's so much harder to give what we don't have. Uh, so there's going to be an element of the presentation coming up is, is, is a lot of it's around this self-love, self-care and how to do more of it. And when I'm saying self-love and self-care, it's not telling you to go out and um, get your nails done or do your hair or whatever. Yes, that, 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 that is, self, that, that is self, a, a form of self-care, but there's a lot more to self-care uh, beyond just these externalizations of self-care. And the third point is around this giving. Ultimately, we're all on this earth 
to give and to contribute. And the reason why I have it in this growing sense is we need to focus on ourselves, um, okay? We need to focus on what we can control. What we can control is what we do around self-care and self-love, and that puts us in a more resourceful state and in a more state that we want to then give to others. I'm not saying that you need to do it in this order. I'm, you can give right away and you can give generously and you can give all the, you know, but the thing is when you give and give and give and don't put anything back into your bucket in terms of that self-care and preservation, then things will start to fall apart in terms of your health and you won't be able to keep giving like the way you want to and that will frustrate you. So it's an important balance that you need to be looking after yourself so that you can better care for others. So let's get into these habits. So how can you help shape your new identity from forming, you know, from creating some of these habits and implementing them throughout your day? But before that, I just wanted to share this analogy. You may have heard this before, but it's a good analogy. I like it because, you know, when you're flying in a plane, and most of us have flown in a plane before and we go through that safety talk, this reflects those principles that I shared in the previous slide. When we're in a plane and something goes wrong and, the, and, and there's a loss of oxygen and we need to rely on these oxygen masks. So in the, you know, the cabin atmosphere is affected, uh, we're reliant on these oxygen masks. You have trust in the pilot, uh, you let him fly, you let him take over in terms of what he knows best and then you focus on what you can control. And what you can control is obviously getting your oxygen mask, putting it on yourself. Then you're more resourceful to help more people. If you don't have your oxygen mask on yourself, if you haven't done that first step, then what happens is that you, there's only so many people you can help before you die. <laughs> um, so it makes sense that you need to uh, fulfill yourself um, so that you can serve more people. So it's the same as I'm on a mission to help as many people on their health journey as possible. But I know if I let my health deteriorate, I can't do that. I can't achieve my mission. So I just wanted to reiterate this, this with an analogy that you could relate to. So let's get into the tips for a happy, resilient day. I've got here, and, and look, there's no order to this. I, I may show it in an order because uh, some people, particularly if you've got an engineering mindset like me, you may be looking for an order. So that's hence why I've put it in some sort of order. But if you're not an engineer like me and you don't like the order I have, it doesn't need to go in this order, just like the previous slide I had around the principles. You just need to make sure you're finding a balance amongst them. So the first point here I want to make is around this what you can control is having a plan for your life. If you don't, someone else will plan your life and they will plan it for what they think is best for you, but it may not be what you want and that will lead to unhappiness and unfulfillment. And that ha can happen in relationships when there's a dominant person in the relationship. They can control the other person and really plan their life. And that person over time, they, they, they might like, like it at the beginning because they're looking for that um, security and they're looking, um, they lack a bit of self-confidence. So that person brings that self-confidence and that's where they complement. But over time, if that voice of the other partner is not being heard and not being shared or heard or shared or both, then that relationship will deteriorate. That controlling, that dominance cannot go on because it's a one-way street. So that's, where we need to start is we need to know and plan what we want, okay? It really starts with knowing where do you want to be in 10 years? You may not know that. And so don't focus on 10 years because that can be stressful and I don't want to induce any stress in your life. There's enough stress in our lives. But maybe it's just planning your next day. And so from this webinar, I'd love you to start planning some of these habits, planting them amongst your day. And it could just be taking each day as it comes because you don't know where you want to be in a decade. That's fine. You'll find it eventually. I didn't, you know, I I didn't know as a kid that I'd be doing what I am doing today. Um, you know, and, and so that I couldn't plan out that far. I, I did. I, I, I went on a journey and there was a reason why I went on that journey. Um, 
uh, but I've arrived at where I've wanted to be. So don't expect to find it overnight. We know C- Colonel Sanders didn't find, <laughs> found KFC overnight. <laughs> you know, it was right when he was in his 70s. Um, so plan your life, your days, your weeks, your months, whatever. Otherwise, someone else will. Uh, that's important uh, because then eventually, yes, y- y- you can go with it. You can go with that flow, but eventually it will lead to you feeling unfulfilled, unheard, unrecon- and, and not you know meeting your needs. So that's important aspect. The second point here is really important and it's really owning your morning because it follows on from the planning your day, right? So if we don't have, you know, if we don't think about the night before in terms of what we want to do the next day, then we'll just allow these notifications to dictate our day. And and then we get to the end of the day and think, I achieved nothing. I really, I ran around, but I didn't really achieve anything. It's because you, you're at everyone else's beck and call. Um, if the night before you think about, okay, tomorrow I'm going to exercise. Exercise is going into here in the day. I do this every day. I'm finding out where I can put my exercise in. I have a family, so I can't always fit it in the morning because that's the only time my wife can do it. So she owns the morning in terms of exercise, but I'm always slotting it in somewhere throughout the day. Uh, that's Pre, premeditated, pre-planned, and it doesn't move. It's a commitment to myself. It's a commitment to my self-care. The morning is a great time to own because everyone else is either getting ready for their day and they're not bothering you uh, or they may be relying on you. So you may be a mum and so it's a bit different. But you can own the period before your children get up, right? And so you may want to think about getting up a little bit earlier to own that time. And that's a great time to implement some things you love, right? And I'm not telling you what to do in that time, but I'm just saying doing something for you in that first part of the day really sets you up in a good state of mind for the rest of that the day because you've had that initial fulfillment. So it puts you in this ready state to absorb some hits that will come throughout the day, some requests that you didn't expect. And it does make you more resilient having that morning routine that you own. In that morning routine, remove your phone. Do not allow that phone to dictate. Like, So what can happen? And I think the the numbers are really high. I can't remember the latest statistics, but I think Within 15 minutes of waking, there's a high percentage, much higher than 50%, that reach for their phone and look at their phone within 15 minutes of waking. That can derail your day. Again, you're at other people's beck and call. It can take you off track. It can just totally, you know, just just take you off on a different tangent that you didn't want to intend on. I suggest you do not look at your phone in the morning, right? That way there's no distractions. You can just have time that you want to do dedicated to the things that you love. So some of these things, you know, and I can, I'll can i be talking about what they are, uh, but it's really things that bring you nourishment. Uh, it's essentially doing the things you love. And, you know, it's great to sprinkle some exercise in there because then there's no way that exercise is going to be knocked out of the day through an appointment or a meeting that, you, that your boss surprised upon you. Um, you know, if we can dedicate that morning to exercise, then it's done. It's ticked. You feel good for doing it. Um, you don't need to constantly think about, oh, when am I going to fit it in? Oh, now I've got another appointment just popped in my diary. I'm not going to get my exercise done. You get frustrated. Uh, so find your morning routine. I'm going to go through some tips around the morning routine, um, but really own that. Don't look at the phone is my number one tip because it will totally throw you off course. It will waste time. Uh, The third point here is the routine. And so everything that I'm sharing is no good as a one-off. It's like taking a supplement as a one-off. You're not going to notice a benefit. Um, Drugs do give a one-off relief. Um, However, you know, with supplements, like any lifestyle modification or any nutrition modification, it's the time where you'll get the benefit. So it's like sowing a seed. You don't expect the fruit that day. 
Um, with nutrition and lifestyle changes, you sow the seed, you do it on a consistent basis, and then over time, you will start to really reap the benefits. And so there's an element of making it part of your routine and being consistent, and that ultimately will bring you results. So things I'm going to share with you won't change things overnight, but apply consistently, they will get deliver results. So let's talk about this happy, resilient day. I'm going to start sharing some examples, some practical tips. Um, ultimately, it will start with the night before uh, because sleep is fundamental to your emotions the next day. A lack of sleep will put you in a primitive mindset. Primitive mindset is survival. It's all about survival. It's all about um, that, uh, you know, so your body goes into survival mode. It will just do things to keep you going. Uh, in survival mode, uh, we don't think, you know, happiness doesn't exist. In survival mode, it's all about getting what you want um, and you keep driving until you feel satisfied and the element of happiness or uh, being able to smile when you're sleep deprived is really impaired. Uh, you, in order to be in a more uh, resourceful state emotionally, we need our sleep. That sleep we need to have is the eight hours as stated. Um, and the leading uh, professor in sleep, Professor Matthew Walker, shares that it, it is this magic seven to eight hours that is important. And he has loads of evidence behind that. And it's the REM sleep of the night. So our dreaming sleep, it's the, and that's predominantly at the last phase of sleep in the night. So that I'm talking early hours in the morning. It's that time where we have the, uh, I guess, where we really, uh, our emotions are looked after, so to speak, um, if I'm not going to use scientific jargon. So our emotional well-being, welfare is really supported in that last phase of sleep in the night. So being short-sleeped and thinking, you know, you're a hero if you can get away with, uh, there's only a very small, less than 1% of the population that can get away with less than seven hours and uh, still be in a resourceful mode. So sleep is a must if you want a happy, resilient day. And that really starts with a nightly routine the night before. So in order to get a good night's sleep, we need to set ourselves up. And so we need to establish healthy boundaries around sleep. And that healthy boundaries, are the, the approachments we've had, uh, such as from technology. So technology's bring brought a lot of efficiencies, but it's also creating a lot of inefficiencies because we're not in a resourceful state the next day because we're sleep deprived as a result of overusing technology. So yes, we need to... Uh, use technology for efficiencies, but then there's a there's a fine medium between overuse um, to the detriment of your health. Uh, so uh, certainly, if you have a bedtime, and ideally, you know, if I'm talking generalized here, you know, you, you want to be sleeping by 10 p.m. because our uh, the sleep at the start of the night is when we have all this. Is it our, our body repairs essentially. So it's the repair work, the maintenance work that goes on is that from 10 to 2 a.m. is all that repair work. So our, our cells, so that sweeping out of mutated cells, uh, clearing them out, um, repairing, you know, cells, you know, allowing for proper replication of cells, all that happens in this first uh, phase of the night, this 10, uh, 10 p.m. to 2 a.m. So from 10 p.m. before that, you want to have at least two hours of winding down. And that two-hour period, you want to have minimal blue light, minimal blue light exposure. Uh, and that means minimal exposure to technology. You know, what technology can bring us in this sort of this late part of the night is more stress. And with stress, it delays the ability to fall asleep. Uh, you think from a survival thing, when we were stressed out in nature, it was because there was a threat. 
we're wired not to sleep when there's a threat. And so if we're on our mobile phone getting emails that we don't like or people that are bullying us or something like that, you know, we're on social media, we're getting bullied or we're getting bullied at work or our boss is harassing us. If we're looking at those emails, that's going to put you in a stress state. That stress state is going to be totally unresourceful for you getting a good night's sleep. So by creating this boundary that you do not look at your phone from 8 p.m., for example, locking it away, putting it away, turning it on airplane mode, do not touch, even locking it in a jar uh, where your flatmate or your partner knows the password and you don't, that is really helpful. Uh, disconnecting from technology early on, uh, as early on, you know, at least two hours before you want to fall asleep uh, is really helpful because what that allows is it stops the inputs coming in to us, right? So during the day, it's constant stimulus coming in, inputs, you know, sensory inputs, um, information overload, it's all coming in, in, in. And there's very, there's probably nothing, no part of your day that allows for the processing of those inputs. It's just constant demand or inputs. And it often, this is why you don't sleep, is you know when the only time when you start processing all these inputs is when you lie in bed and you think, oh, all these thoughts are bouncing around in my head. Oh, I'm just just so wired. It's because you haven't allowed yourself that time to process all that information that's come in during the day. And so, by stopping at 8 p.m. allows two hours of you just allowing these thoughts to pop in. You write them down if it's on you. You know, it's things you haven't done. For example, write them down. It's, oh, I forgot to get back to that person, write it down. So, or, oh, you know, I, oh, I need to do this tomorrow, write it down. And so rather than just letting it ruminate in your head by, you know, if you don't write it down, it will ruminate in your head. You'll constantly turn it over and think about it. But putting it on paper takes it out of the mind. It helps clear the mind. Uh, this clearing of the mind, reducing the clutter, allowing the calmness of the mind allows us to get into this sleep state. Add to that darkness, okay? So you don't want to be allowing this discharge or this processing of information and putting it on paper, putting it away for tomorrow. You don't want that to be happening with a lot of blue light or fluorescent lighting, white light, right? Because that blue light, the white light really uh, stops the rise of melatonin. Melatonin is, a, you know, it helps put us to sleep, right? So we want that melatonin rising as the sun goes down uh, and in order for that our light receptors in our eyes need to witness that darkness the fall of darkness so you want to definitely minimize the amount of light exposure from 8 p.m onwards uh, so ideally it is you know with a bit of warm light so your, your old school lamp um, that more warmer light not that white light uh, you certainly don't want to be looking at screens if you have to look at a screen then put those blue light filters on uh, so you can uh, you know set your phone to night mode you can set your computer to night mode if you need to look at a screen i suggest you don't you should stop working because the more you work um, the more stress is in your body and the longer it's going to take to calm down. So start creating some physical boundaries. It might just start with you creating a, a boundary around mobile phone use um, or it might require, you know, you might just start journaling. You know, you might just start jotting down on paper your to-do list, your things you want to get done the next day. I suggest a good tip around creating a to-do list is creating a to-be list because I spoke about this self-identity, the self-image, and you may identify after this webinar that you want to be a more happier person or a more resilient person. So on that to-be list next to your to-do list is right, I want to be more happy, right? So to put down in order for me to accomplish this to-do list, I want to be happy because when you're more happier, you have better relationships. You can better influence your managers, your peers in terms of your way of thinking if you need to do that in the workplace, uh, if you're happier, right? Um, 
So that can be more resourceful for you accomplishing what you want to achieve that day is being in that to be list. So you may need to be more focused. You may want to, you know, you don't want to procrastinate. So that therefore I want to be more focused. I want to be happier. I want to be able to bounce back I, or, I would, I, you know, so it's putting a to be list next to your to do list is very helpful. Creating these boundaries around health, really helpful the night before. Uh, an example of what this routine may look like uh, is, you know, having a, a, you don't want to be eating too late. So essentially in terms of the right time to eat before bed is you want to be going to bed feeling not too heavy, not too light, just right. A bit like the Goldilocks sort of scenario. So you certainly don't want to go to bed hungry because that will affect your ability to fall asleep if you're starving because starvation puts you in that fight or flight, that stress mode of survival. Um, if you're too full, um, it, it's just too much work that needs to be done uh, before you can fall asleep. Your body needs to digest. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, so you want to find that good time to allow your food to digest before, you know, so you get to bed and you're feeling just comfortable. So I've put a, a suggestion here, 7 p.m. This may not work for you. As I said, I'm talking generally. Uh, and then after dinner, have some relaxed time, uh, do something you like. But as I said, I only do that until uh, 8 p.m. If it's like watching TV, stop watching t TV at 8 p.m. Uh, and then after 8 p.m., it's really creating a nourishing routine to bedtime. So uh, I'll, share, I'll share you my routine. It's pretty much what's in front of you. Um, I will reduce lighting. So I pretty much have just the moonlight. I've got plenty of windows, so it allows the moonlight to come into the house. Moonlight will allow you to walk around without tripping over. It's not complete darkness, uh, but allows my brain to register night and therefore the melatonin is starting to rise to help making me feel sleepy. I have some music playing in the background. Uh, so it's music that relaxes me and that will be different to what relaxes you. Mine is nature sounds. I love the sound of waterfalls or birds and waves breaking. It just it, That brings me peace. Uh, I've, it, as I'm doing this, I'm carrying around a little notebook. Uh, I've got my notebook here. Uh, so here my little notebook. And I'm writing down uh, the things that, are on my mind so so I don't keep ruminating on them I'm putting them on paper I'm getting them out of my mind I'm decluttering um, I'm also you know focusing on the person I want to be I know who I want to be every day uh, so uh, I'm thinking about that person uh, and I'm putting it out there uh, I'm also if there's any ill feelings or anything that's hurt me during the day, I'm also recognizing that. I'm noting that. I'm not suppressing it. I'm putting a note to that. I'm putting it on paper. I'm just putting it down there just to get it out of my brain. I don't want to ruminate on a bad relationship conversation I had that day. I don't want to because the more you ruminate on it, the more you're going to get excited and less ability you have to fall asleep. So I put it on paper. And then I finish this journaling exercise with thoughts of gratitude. And I do this with my children. Before I put them to bed, I'm always talking about gratitude with my children. I'm asking them what do they want to thank the world for about their day. And they come up with the most amazing things. Um, and you really get to better connect with your children by asking them what they're grateful for. And you can do this with your partner. And when you start to focus on gratitude, and again, it's like I mentioned at the start of the webinar, this law of attraction. So if I'm starting to look for things I can give thanks for, my next day, I'm constantly on the thing of thinking, oh, I appreciate that, you know, that gesture that person made to me, or I appreciate that bus driver recognizing me uh, and pulling in and picking me up, even though I gave him a last minute notice. Um, or you're just appreciating the small things that are happening. And the more you do this appreciation, the more you start noticing the smaller things that happen in your life and you start focusing on them. And then you have this sense of appreciation. And when, if I refer back to that definition of happiness, there was an element of happiness. You know, happiness is defined as contentment, right? So if you want more happiness, 
you need to be more content, right? And content comes from you being grateful for what you have and for what's around you. And so if you have this attitude of gratitude, it will bring more happiness. So that's a really important point. And I always do it every night. And because I've done it every night for ages, I now see it and recognize it throughout the day. I would look in the sky and notice a pattern. I think that's beautiful, you know, and I, I see beauty in nature all the time. I see beauty in people all the time. I, you know, I, I'm, I'm very thankful for everything that happens to me throughout the day. And me openly expressing it brings the gratitude to front of mind. So this, it's important to recognize it and to note it because it brings it to front of mind. And that, that reinforces the behavior. Front of mind, it becomes reinforced behavior and it becomes autonomous, eventually becomes into our subconscious. So I'm going to get into... I'm running out of time. (laughs) I get too excited. Um, But I'm going to get into some happiness uh, tips that I do uh, that have really served me. Uh, You've probably read in terms of the rest of my nightly routine, but that's essentially what I do. I do some stretching. Um, I love it. Uh, it, You know, I have that, that shower. I stretch. It tells my muscle everything's okay. If I stretch my muscles, they don't need to be tense. So therefore, it's telling the brain that, I've got to be safe. If when my muscles are tense, I'm getting away from a tiger or I'm getting, you know, you you know, you tense up when you're stressed, right? So if you relax your muscles, it sends a signal to your brain that everything's okay. You don't need, you're not running away from a tiger anymore. You you can chill. So uh, breathing, deep breathing also does this. So when you're, so when you're getting away from a tiger, you're breathing shallow, you're taking in, you know, you're breathing shallow, shallow, trying to get in as much oxygen as possible. When you you know, when you get, you know, when you like after a stressful event, you'll draw a deep sigh of relief, right? You'll, you know, you'll take that deep breath. That's a signal to your brain that everything's okay, right? So you can automatically signal to your brain everything's okay by just starting to deep breathe. So I do this deep breathing at night and it it's sending the signals to my brain that I must be okay. There's no threats. Um, and, you know, through that deep breathing, I'm only focused on deep breathing. I'm not focused on rumination of thoughts or, you know, that those negative thoughts that may come into my mind. Okay, so let's get into how we can sprinkle happiness and resilience throughout your day. I've mentioned the morning routine and you finding that morning routine that works for you. I've got a picture here of a smiley face, and that's very much me throughout the day. And it's become automated in my day. So I started, so this started decades ago with me doing my morning run when I could. I have children now, I can't, but I used to get out there the crack of dawn and run. And I used to, on that run, I used to recognize every person I came across. So I noted that individual. Everyone likes to be noticed and recognized, right? It's a human need. And so then me recognizing them makes them feel better, Okay. And I also smiled in recognizing, I'd say, hi, how are you doing? I'd be smiling. And sometimes I wouldn't get any acknowledgement back, but that's not what I'm doing it. I'm really making that other person feel better. And eventually on this run, you start running into the same people all the time and they, they start to resonate with your vibration, your higher level of vibration. And you you, that, then you start getting acknowledgement back from them. Um, and then you can see that that behavior is instilled in them and that they may propagate that out to the rest of the world. But this whole exercise for me then made, it, it, it actually became automated for me. So I walk down the streets, I will smile and recognize people. And I, I do get the looks of, you know, who is that person, you know, but eventually they feel like they know me um, and they get to know me just through my acknowledgement of them and smiling. That behavior has become automated in what I do. And so when I walk out in the streets, I often get these smiles back and I'm thinking, Oh wow, that's that. That feels beautiful. Everyone loves to receive a smile, right? You, you know what the warmth that brings to your heart when you receive a smile, and it makes you smile, and it brings that state of happiness to you. So, I suggest you start smiling more. You start acknowledging people more. You start acknowledging them for what they do for you. It could be very small, but just acknowledging that, and 
it will come back in some form at some point. It may not come back immediately. Uh, and it, it, you know, don't expect it to come back. Uh, you just put it out there and eventually in some form it will come back. Uh, so that leads me on to the next point of what you can do during the day around this element of giving. And it doesn't cost anything. You don't need to hand out money or shout people or whatever. It can just be giving courtesy, giving kindness, recognizing people, um, showing love and respect to people. That's giving. Uh, You know, like, for example, if you commute on public transport, it's offering up your seat for someone else. It's just being courteous. It's letting people in, in front of you, in the queue. It's you know, some driver needs to get in, let them in. Um, it's just doing these acts, random acts of kindness, scatter them throughout the day and they will in time, in time, bring you fulfilment, okay? So just go out there and give and spread and sp- spread kindness and love and generosity, smiles, warmth, acknowledging people, giving thanks, doing that throughout your day. It doesn't take it doesn't take much time. It doesn't take much effort, but it brings so much fulfillment. So uh, that's pretty much what you can do during the day and that will bring more state of happiness to you and more and, and will help that resilience within you because you feel better about yourself for doing it. And that puts you in a better position to manage life events. If you feel better about yourself, then you can better respond to life events. If that person is, if someone's angry to you and you're in a good resourceful state because you've been spreading kindness, generosity, and love, then you can respond in such a way that it brings that anger down. It dampens their anger. Um, If we're in a state of busyness, stress, not looking after ourselves, we come across that angry person, you've got, you're going to have a primitive response. And that primitive response will be survival in nature and it'll be me versus them, uh, you know, and there's going to be one winner. <laughs> and so, it, you know, it, it ultimately ends up in a fight, right, or a, an un, unresourceful conversation. No one wins. Everyone walks away unhappy, dissatisfied. You need to be in a higher level of vibration to better respond to these events, to reduce. And I'll give you, I'll share an example. I've got enough time. I know I don't, (laughs) but uh, I I, I did come up across, you know, like, so I was walking uh, along this shared path between cars and um, uh, cars and pedestrians. And I'm a pedestrian and this car nearly run me over. And I just sort of shrugged and just said, Oh, you know, in shock and, you know, sort of saying, Oh, I'm here, you know, um, you could have nearly killed me. This guy gets out of the car and he wants to fight me. And I've just been nearly been hit by him. Right. I've done no wrong. It's a shared walkway. And he's going, you want to go, mate? Do you want to go? I'm ready to go. Let's do it. And, 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 and he, it, it was really agitated and aggressive. And I felt threatened. My life was, you know, threatened. And I stayed calm. And I said, no, I, you know, I, I, I was just taken back that, you know, I was, you know, nearly hit by you. And he goes, I wasn't speeding. You know, you can't be. I know. Anyway, so he, he was firing up. And, um, and then I kept responding in a calm way. And he would come back with fire. So he's going, oh, you just want to go. Come on, let's do it. Let's do it. I'm going to smash you. And, and you know, I was getting a bit uptight because I felt threatened. And so you, you start getting stressed. And so I just kept coming from that point of I've got to stay calm and I've got to stay collected and I'm just going to help calm this guy. And eventually he calmed down and he drove off. But that if, if I had have been in an unresourceful state, and I'm going to finish on this point. I'm sorry I didn't get onto the other points, but uh, I may just continue and share the webinar with you. So you can certainly, I, I know we're up to the hour. So certainly I acknowledge if you need to go to your next meeting, but I, I will just finish the webinar because I know um, I'm, I'm recording it. So uh, I will continue on with nutrition and everything else. But um, yeah, so if I had been in a stress state, like busy, you know, I'm running from, you know, I, I was coming back with the groceries for the family. Um, oh, then I've got to go and pick up this kid and all that. And if I had been really focused in all the stuff I needed to do and in and, and that busy mindset, stress mindset, 
then I may have not responded to that guy in the way, like the way I did. And I may have ended up second best, right? And I may not be here today. Um, so uh, I'm not a fighter and I can assure he, he came across as someone that loved fighting. So, um, but it was because I was in that more resourceful state. And that was because I'd done things for myself that day and continued to do these random acts of kindness, this giving. And, you know, things I do is I, I pick up rubbish in the streets and there's, there's no real benefit for me other than I feel that that's the way I want to see the world. I want to see clean streets and I don't want this rubbish ending up in the ocean and hurting, you know, the, the wildlife in the ocean. Um, there is that element to it, but it's the next person that comes along is going to see a clean street. You know, I, I see a dirty street. I just clean it. Um, but that is me just giving and not expecting anything back. And, and it does come back. And it came back to me that day in terms of it res- rescued me from that uh, life threatening situation. Uh, so during the day, if you feel a bit agitated, then you can get in a more, more resourceful state but as I said before, deep breathing or just becoming more mindful. So it's just connecting with the way you feel. You know, if you're feeling a bit tight in an area, just acknowledging that and sitting with it and just, uh, you know, just connecting with the way you're feeling, um, you know, feeling your feet on the ground. Uh, it's, um, you know, connecting with your breath, acknowledging your breathing. I mean, it, it's fantastic that we're breathing. We're all breathing at the moment because without – this automated breathing, uh, we wouldn't be here. So um, uh, connecting with breath, recognizing the breath, being thankful for the trees that put oxygen into the world so that we can survive. Uh, and I'm sure the trees thank us for putting out the carbon dioxide so that they can survive. But it's 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 this ha- harmony thing, right? Uh, we want to be more harmonious. Uh, we want to be more resourceful so that we can give more. Now onto the nutrition principles, okay, as a nutritionist. So again, I focus on principles. I'm not going to tell you about a specific diet you should eat or a specific way in which you should eat. I share principles. And the reason why I share principles is because it's, you know, you can give a man a fish and feed him for a day, or you can teach a man how to fish and feed him for a lifetime. And that is where we part principles. I shared principles at the start of this presentation around happiness and resilience. Now I'm sharing the principles around nutrition. So it, it, it's very much, you know, we get energy and nourishment from food. And so in order to maximize that nourishment, that fulfillment that food brings us, we want to be eating seasonal and local produce. Seasonal and local produce is full of vitality, nutrients, and minerals. The longer food, you know, is in the supply chain, you know, or the longer it has to travel, those vitamins, minerals decline over time and quite rapidly through temperature and, you know, temperature cycling and aging. So, we want to be as close to the source as possible. Hence, buy from your local farmer, go to local farmers market, buy the fresh produce. Uh, they only sell what's in season from the farmers. Your supermarkets, it's hard to tell what's in season, right? So uh, support your local farmers, go to the um, markets, get your produce. Um, so, you know, buy organic where possible. I understand, you know, there's price points and, you know, if you can't buy organic, don't worry about it. Um, I always share with my clients to then focus on buying the clean 15 and the dirty dozen. So sort of segregate it by buying uh, fruits and vegetables that aren't sprayed much um, and therefore you buy them as they are, uh, not uh, non-organic. Uh, and then the ones that are sprayed a lot, uh, the dirty dozen. So if you Google clean 15, dirty dozen, you will see what fruits are categorized under each. But the uh, clean 15 are typically... Uh, fruits and vegetables that don't need to be, um, well, they don't need to be, they, they, they don't have a lot of uh, pesticides attacking it or pesticides, pests attacking it. So therefore, they're, they're not sprayed with a lot of pesticide. Um, so they're fairly clean. Uh, or they've got an outer coating, such as an avocado or a banana. You get what I mean? Like they're, 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 there's a, you, you peel them. So uh, the inside is quite protected. Uh, the reason why I say that, because we don't want to induce any more chemicals than what we have to, because uh, the more load we put on our 
body or, you know, like in terms of our uh, detoxification organs, the harder they work, um, uh, it's the more stress on the body, essentially. The more processing it has to do of toxins, the more stress. Uh, and we don't want to add any more stress to a body. You know, that stress creates inflammation. Um, and with our lifestyles, we're already inflamed as much as it is uh, with all the exposure to EMFs and everything else around us, bombardments of air pollution or whatever it may be. Uh, so we want to minimize our exposure to toxins to just allow our bodies to work more efficiently, to allow them to do what they do best without too much interference. Buy whole foods and a wide variety. So, you know, you hear a lot about gut health and everything like that. Ultimately, you can support gut health through just eating a wide variety, large diversity of fruit, vegetables, whole grains. Uh, and, and when I say this, I'm talking general. So, you know, there's people that are gluten intolerant, there's people that are lactose intolerant. And so, yes, you, you need to um, not have those in your diet. Uh, but what I'm saying is beyond that, don't exclude certain foods because the media has labeled them uh, as you know, fat or something, um, you know, whole foods, wild, wild, <laughs> wide, wide variety will really support good gut health. It will be high fibrous in nature. It will have, you know, this, our plant-based fats are healthy fats, right? They're not saturated fats. They're polyunsaturated fats. They're healthy fats. Uh, they're monounsaturated fats. Uh, they're not the saturated fats that we get from animals. So, you know, these whole foods, wide variety, you really can't go wrong because they're lots of fiber, they'll give lots of satiety, they'll bring lots of minerals and vitamins. But in order for you to not eat too much, because, you know, there's that propensity in our society today, because food is in abundance, it's so easy to overeat, right? And because we have so much stress, um, eating food brings some comfort, right? It helps us relieve stress if we don't have other resources to relieve that stress. So this is where the timing comes into it, right? And the planning, right? Um, so these last two points around planning and preparation. So planning and preparation will set you up for success. So again, I mentioned that at the start of the webinar about planning your week, you know, putting in the things that are important to you and locking them in uh, and then they don't move. And so one of those things is food preparation. So it's allowing time to go and shop or you can do online shopping, but it's also allowing you time to prepare for the week. So you might have a busy week scheduled. I understand people are busy and I acknowledge that. However, you know, you can allocate some time Sunday afternoon, Sunday evening with the family and just have some fun preparing some meals. It can be fun. You can have a lot of fun around it. You can create themes. This week going to be Japanese week, right? So we're going to have lots of Japanese cuisines and we're going to uh, prepare miso soup for the week. Um, we're going to prepare um, sushi rolls for the week. You know, like you can have some fun. You can prepare Mexican. You can prepare Lebanese. You can prepare Mediterranean. You can have these theme weeks where you prepare lots of these large batches of food and, and that sets you up for the week. So if you've got a busy week, you're not buying a lot of takeaway because you've set yourself up by doing that prior preparation. In terms of timing, uh, like people ask me, you know, when's, when should I eat? You want to be eating in daylight hours, right? That's when our digestive system is set up to break down food. It's not set up to break down food during nighttime. Nighttime is to do nighttime things, and that's repair and recovery uh, and to help you emotionally, right, um, and help you be more creative. Um, so that's all that stuff that happens at nighttime, but it's not we know we don't have the amount of digestive enzymes at night as what we do during the day. So eat during daylight hours. Um, eat when you're hungry uh, and eat slowly. So, you know, if, if you have a propensity to overeat, slow down your eating, engage in mindful eating, really embrace what you're about to consume. Again, acknowledge what it is, give thanks for what it is, who's put it like. So give thanks to the person that's prepared it. Give thanks to the farmer that's created this great crop uh, that you're now enjoying. So give out lots of thanks. And this is where grace comes, you know, like so people that are, have a religion will often say grace before a meal. And that's what it is. It's, it's expressing gratitude for what you're about to receive. 
So, you know, you don't have to be religious to do this practice. You can just sit down there and just look at the food and just really, you know, thank the people that have really lots of energy and time has been put in by a lot of people to get it there in front of you. Uh, so just acknowledging that, recognizing that and seeing the food for what it is and seeing it for it nourishing you. Don't look at food as a calorie or a fat or a protein. Take it in for what it is. See it as nourishment. Provided you're sticking to these principles, it will be nourishment, right? I don't mention fast food in here or I don't mention um you know, chips and fries or processed stuff. I'm not mentioning that. I'm talking about principles here. So if you've adopted these principles and these principles are in the plate in front of you, embrace it, connect with it, enjoy it. And really, you know, enjoy the company that you're with, right? So it's um, it's joining in on the conversation. It's having a chew, putting the knife and fork down, chewing, conversing, connecting, and then having another mouthful. It's really like every meal should be like when you're dining out at a fine dining restaurant. You know, at a fine dining restaurant, you end up eating a whole lot less than when you do at home because it's the experience. You're connecting with the food. You're excited about what's in front of you. You're excited about the company on the opposite side to you. Uh, It's the whole experience. You can create that experience at home by putting away the devices, putting away all the distractions, um, you know, turning the phones on to mute or silent, putting them away from the table, connecting with the people in, around you, having nice conversation, engaging the food. If you do that, you won't overeat, you'll eat slowly. You, you will actually pick up the signals of satiety uh, within that period of time and that will stop you from going back to getting seconds. The reason why we get seconds is our body hasn't even registered what we've put in it because we've eaten it so quickly that it hasn't had time to let the brain know that it's full. (laughs) And then say, therefore you go, I'm still hungry. I need seconds. I need thirds. I need fours. It's because you're shoveling. Slow down. You'll eat less. Engage with the food. You'll eat less. You'll get the same level of nourishment and you won't overeat. I hope that's helpful around nutrition. In terms, of, I'm wrapping up the presentation here, and I thank you for bearing with me. Uh, so you've been awesome. Uh, in terms of the the you know the resources, so obviously you know I've done these two degrees, eight years of study. Um, uh, that's come into it. There's been numerous papers that I've read over the course of the time I've been in this profession. Uh, but these books are available to you and they talk in a very human, you know, you're reading a scientific study or, you know, a clinical paper or whatever. It, it, it doesn't talk in your language. So these books talk in your language. They're great resources. Um, so Think Like a Monk is a great one around mindset. You know, so I talked about the mindset. Um, I talked about gratitude. I talked about giving. Uh, think like a monk. So take away the monk side of things. It's more thinking like a fantastic human being and being being the person that you'd like to convey to the world. It's really helping you with that thinking. So you can, you know, if you've got an issue or, you know, some judgment of monks, uh, which I don't, but I, I know some people do, um, disconnect from that. The book's fantastic. Uh, and it really talks in practical sense as to what you can do about it. Uh, why we sleep, it's so powerful, powerful in terms of persuading you of why you need to um, prioritize your sleep. And sleep's become a major priority in my life and in my practice as a clinical nutritionist. Uh, you know, it's done by a professor. He's, as I said, one of the leading researchers in sleep. And indistractable is really good in terms of these forming these good positive habits and really becoming that person you want to become and self-identifying with that person you want to be. Great books. I suggest you have a read. I I, I got a lot out of them. Um, In terms of how I can, and I know some of you have joined me and it could be because of this reason, because I was giving away a $55 prize to everyone that attended. And yes, I, you know, I note those that have attended this presentation and this is for those that have actually uh, joined me today uh, for this presentation. So uh, I'm about to hit quest- Q&A. So just letting you know, uh, if you'd like this session with me, uh, where I basically tailor the, well, I tailor whatever you want, actually. Uh, so you, you, whatever your goal is, I'll help 
tailor a food and lifestyle medicine approach to that goal for 20 minutes. Uh, we can cover a lot of ground in 20 minutes. So feel free to reach out. I'm happy to uh, help you uh, and tailor, I guess, the information I shared today to fit in with your lifestyle. I, I spoke very general. Uh, if you if that's not for you, but you'd like to connect, then certainly connect with me. All my podcasts are on my uh, website, which are here. I share all the videos of the podcast on my Facebook page, and I'm constantly on Facebook and Instagram sharing tips and advice around health and well-being. I'm going to 